Okay, so I'm going to go again started. Uh, my name is Chris Hostetter, or Haas, uh, if I haven't met you before, nice to meet you. Um, this is the first talk on the first day in the Lucene Solar and Friends track, so I'm pretty sure if you're interested in Lucene solar related talks, this is your new home for the next two days for the most part. Um, I am uh, currently an employee at LucidWorks. I'm a committer and uh, PMC member for Lucene and Solar. I have been involved with solar from the beginning, from before it was an open source project. I worked at CNET. Yannick and I were, you know, hammering away on it back in 2004, I think, 2005, I forget. Anyway, um, if you uh, want copies of these slides, they're up there. That URL will be on the screen later, so don't worry about copying it down now. Here, here today to talk about what's new in Apache Solar. Um, since this is the first talk, it also, I have kind of, I was a little concerned. I didn't know how many people would have no idea what solar is or would be looking for sort of an introductory to solar. So I can kind of go two different ways of this talk. My goal was really to focus on what is new since 4.0, but I would like to do a quick show of hands and just kind of get a sense of who is totally unfamiliar with solar because if you are, I want to spend a little time just giving you some more background. Um, so a quick show of hands, who here is running solar in production somewhere? Okay, let's do it the other way. Who is not running solar in production somewhere? All right, so you don't count. Uh, all right, so three guys to vote for. You're lying. Wait, I recognize you. I don't, what was your name? Marvin. That's right, Marvin. You're not running solar production, but yeah, no, you don't count either. All right, so you three guys there, so you're not running solar production, but are you, are you familiar with solar? Have you done the solar tutorial? You've installed it, you've, you've played with it a little bit. How about you? Uh, no, literally, like you three guys who raised your hands. Wait, uh, now I forgot which one of you raised your hand. You raised your hand. Have you run through this solar tutorial before? You've played a little bit with it? How about you? You haven't done the solar tutorial? Okay, so for the benefit of everybody else, I'm not gonna spend, but you know what, hit me up afterwards. Happy to talk to you about personally. Anyway, so the first thing I wanna talk about that's new in solar is acceleration. Uh, literally, the rate at which we are releasing new features is pretty fucking impressive these days. Um, this graph, don't worry about the numbers, it's a little hard to read, but the main thing to pay attention to is the, the x-axis here is time, and this is showing you all of the feature releases, we're not even counting bug fixes, just the feature releases Solar has had in its history at Apache. Uh, the y is to help you sort of see the rate of acceleration. What this is showing is, for any given feature release, how many more were there in the previous 12 months. So you can kind of see early on, we were lucky if we were getting one release a year. We started getting up to two and three during the three X line. Once we hit 4.0, we've now been doing about five, rele five feature releases a year. So the rate that we're getting features out there to the users is kind of mind blowing at this point. Um, and that's really why I wanted to do this talk today was because 4.0 only came out a year ago. And there is already, you know, that was a pretty big, it was a pretty big news when 4.0 came out. A lot of people were aware of what was new in 4.0. Today I want to focus on some of the really cool, killer features that are new since 4.0. All right? So the first thing I want to talk about is some new things regarding adding data to your solar index and the schema.xml. I'm assuming everybody except these three guys know what I mean when I talk about a schema.xml. But just a quick reminder, when you add data to solar, you can do it from Java, use uh, SolarJ, uh, you can do it by sending XML, you can do it by sending JSON. When you send data, you're always sending in a list of fields and what values they've got. But what Solar wants, what you want Solar to do with these fields and values is all driven based on a schema. So when you say, I've got a document with an ID, a title, a URL, a rating, <coughs> what you're expecting Solar to know about that data and do with that data all comes down to a schema where you've told it, my ID field is an integer and I want you to index it and store it. Uh, my title field is text. I want you to actually tokenize it so I can search for individual words. My URL is a string. I'm not actually going to search on it. I just want you to give it back. So you don't need to index it, but you do need to store it. Um, my rating is a floating point number. I want to be able to do range queries on it, so I need you to index it. And my authors, uh, you know, the list of people who wrote my documents. Uh, there's going to be more than one. It's text. I want to be able to search on first names, last names independently, stuff like that. This all goes into your schema. And then, of course, there's field types that define what did you mean when you said a string? Well, you literally meant this underlying implementation. Uh, what kind of analyzer did you want on your text field? All of that is configurable in the schema. This is all rote familiarity for everybody, right? How about you three guys? You caught up? All right, good. 
<laughs> sorry, being a punk, but it's all right. Anyway, so this has all been in solar since 1.0, before even Apache. What's relatively new now, thanks to a lot of the work by this man right here, Steve Rowe, uh, is a new schema API. So starting with 4.7, we now have a REST API to get all that information about your field types. We have a REST API to get all the information about your fields. By default, this is all read-only. The field type API is only ever read-only. We're working on making that read-write. But if you want to actually use the REST API to update your schema, that's now possible for the fields. And like I say, it will soon be possible for the field types. All you have to do is turn on a little bit of configuration that says you want a manageable schema. As soon as you turn this on, uh, instead of having a schema.xml file that you hand edit, there's now a data file under the covers. It just happens to be XML still, and it happens to look exactly the same. But it is now a managed data file that Solar manages for you because of the changes you make through that REST API. And then there's this configuration option. Is it mutable or not? What that's for is so that you can start off out of the box with an empty schema. You can use that REST API to manipulate it, to tweak it, do whatever you want, similar to how you would you know, use a, a, an API into like your MySQL database to add and drop and add columns and things. But then once you're sort of getting to the point where you're like, no, no, I'm ready to go to production. I want to lock this down. You just toggle that bully and you don't have to worry about stray development clients you know, adding 200 fields or removing fields or whatever. Um, Along with this, though, this is, this is all about making your schema mutable. And one way to make your modifications to your schema is with those REST APIs we talked about. The other way is through something that, unfortunately, in my opinion, um, has become known as a schemaless setup. Uh, I, I really, to me, this is a very bad word, which is why there's a question mark there. There is always a schema. There is always a way for Solar or you know, even Lucene below that to know and to care what properties any given field should have. A better word, in my opinion, is dynamic data-driven schema. What that's all about is the idea that when you sent your document and you said, here's a numeric field, here's a string field, here's a floating point number, that as soon as it saw that field for the first time, as soon as you sent a document with a rating field that had a floating point number, it said, okay, I'm gonna treat that as a float moving forward. And this is now available in Solar using some update processors. Quick show of hands, who here has ever configured an update processor? Who has? If you have configured, raise your hands. Because people are more willing to say what they've done than be shy about what they don't know. Okay, so what update processors are is it's a way for you to adjust the pipeline that Solar uses when you add documents. When you shove data into Solar, it automatically goes through, there's always at least one update processor pipeline which says, well, what do I do with that data? How do I massage it before I add it to the index? And you can configure, this looks kind of complicated, but really it's just a simple mapping that says, when you get a Boolean, when you see a Java Boolean object, make a Boolean field out of it. If you've never seen this field before, if, I've, if I send in stock as a field name in my product data, and I've never seen it before, but it's a Boolean, we'll add a Boolean field to that, right? So you throw this up once in an update processor, and we've got a sample configuration that includes it all. And then you can start with an empty schema, and whatever it sees, it'll start creating the appropriate field types. It'll sort of try them in order. For SolarJ, or for some usages of JSON where you've got really simple data coming in, this is pretty much all you need because the data types, particularly the Java data types, are passed along by the Java client. When you're sending data through XML where it's all very flat and it comes across the wire as strings, or again, even, even with JSON, it, it, you know, telling the difference between an integer and a float in JSON isn't always obvious. Um, we have other update processors that help with that too. Uh, the aptly named parse boolean, parse long, parse double. These guys are all very, um, I'm spacing on the word, they're very forgiving. Uh, and their goal is to say, if this string looks like something I recognize, I will parse it. If it does not, I will leave it alone and I will let the next guy in the chain worry about it. So by configuring them like this, if your client sends a bunch of string data in XML or even sends badly form, you know, if they're using the Java APIs, but instead of giving you a true Boolean, they give you the string true, uh, this guy will say, that, that looks like it should be a Boolean, I'm gonna convert that to a Boolean. That looks like it should be a long, I'm gonna convert that to a long. That looks like it should be a date, I'm gonna convert it to be a date. And once it's done that, the previous guy we talked about, he takes over and says, okay, I see what field types I need to add dynamically, right? So this makes it, this, this, 
for all the developers who've ever said, man, every time I start up solar and I start a new project, the first thing I gotta do is go edit my schema and then load my data and oh shit, I forgot a field, I gotta go add that. This sort of, uh, this really streamlines that development process by letting you, again, not schema-less, there's still a schema under there, you can still see it with the REST APIs, but it's, it's a data-driven schema. And it's also, like I say, it's, it's not just about the, the sort of bare bone basics. There's other configuration options here. Here I showed for the date one, for example. You can, you can use these guys to infer a lot of information based on your business rules that you wouldn't necessarily want to have to deal with yourself. So if you know a client is constantly sending you dates formatted, you know, in uh, using the Paris time zone by default without actually giving you the time zone information, this guy can come in handy and say, you know what, he gives me all sorts of weird date formats, so I'm gonna explicitly configure it to try those first. Um, so this, in my opinion, is a nice, powerful feature. It's not my personal favorite feature, but I know the community has really been asking for a lot of this stuff for a while. Um, and like I say, it definitely helps streamline a lot of the early development when you're getting started. The one caveat I would say, don't forget about this Boolean. When you're done, when you're happy, when you really like your schema, you might want to go turn this to false, just so some guy making a typo and one of your uh, solar clients doesn't start adding data to the wrong fields and it just creates it on the fly. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, the REST API writes it to the file. Sorry, the question was about how this sort of managed schema and what happens with the data and all that. It is um, this data file, which is implementation specific, do not rely on its format, but by the way, it's schema XML. Um, it is updated when the REST API is hit, it is updated automatically, and that, that's, that change is live. Uh, requests will immediately start to take advantage of that. Likewise, if you are using these guys and it finds it, it writes it live and it's actually active for that request. So the next document like automatically gets that even if it's part of one big update. Um, yeah, that, that all happens, that's a good question. That all happens in real time. Yeah, and if you guys have questions, we'll have a little Q&A at the end, don't worry about that, but if anything I say is, what the fuck did you just talk about? Like, feel free to raise your hand. Even if you don't know how to articulate your question, just raise your hand to let me know, like, I don't know what I'm trying to ask, but I need to ask something because that didn't make sense. We'll talk through it, no problem. Um, yeah, so that was, that was the first big thing I want to talk about, which is this new, you know, schema list or dynamic data-driven schema setup. Um, the next feature I want to talk about is kind of a new cool feature in pagination. Um, but again, a quick review in case we need it. Um, this is sort of kind of the basics of what a, a simple solar query might look like. You know, you're searching for a word, nightfall, in a field, title. The, the scores of your documents are gonna be based on the things that are in your query. You know, the TF-IDF relevancy matrix of, uh, of that word and how common it is, that comes into play. You have a filter query, which is a way to constrain the set of documents you match, but it doesn't affect the scoring. So here I'm saying I wanna find all documents with nightfall in the title, but I only want ones back that have a rating of five or better. Um, I wanna sort by score descending, and then basic pagination. I wanna start at the zeroth result, and I want 20 results back, right? Is this familiar to everybody? You three guys, we good? All right, awesome. So what I'm gonna talk about now, the new feature that I wanna talk about is some changes to the way pagination works. Historically, if you're building like a simple UI, right, where people come, they do a search, you show them page one, there's 20 results per page, they have a next button, you show them page two. Um, the basic way to do that is those start and rows parameters I talked about. You have some sort, you have rows of 20, that's how many you want per page, and you have a start value. You send that, Solar says, great, here's page one, here's the first, there are more, but I don't need to show them to you. When you wanna do page two, you just change that start parameter, right? You say, okay, well, now start at 20, but again, I want 20 per page, blah, 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 everything's happy. Um, this works great for those simple UIs. What happens when you wanna crunch all of the results of a query? You're, you're gonna do some external processing and you really need to say, however many matches there were, however many millions of matches I got, I need them all. I need them all in my client. I can't do it server side. Um, it doesn't perform well. Uh, this is a graph, again, uh, the red line is what we're gonna focus on. This was a simple little test I did on my laptop. You know, don't ignore the numbers. The specific numbers don't matter. But what matters is, I said, okay, I've got a million documents. I'm gonna run a query that matches, I don't know, 600,000 something. Um, I have a complicated sort, I'm gonna sort on five different fields, and I need all of them. I wanna pull them all back to my client. How long does that take? 
These are the pages. I asked for a thousand docs per page. When I asked for page zero, it was super fucking fast. But it kind of grows linearly for a while. And not only does it grow linearly, but the, uh, the variance starts to get ridiculous, right? This is, I ran three iterations of this test. So you can see we got nice consistent performance. But once we're up to, you know, the 200,000th result, we're now at a second and a half per request, and it's varying almost half a second. Um, not good, right? Red is bad. So cursors to the rescue, as I pause for a refreshing beverage. A cursor sort of changes the dynamic. Um, basically, instead of saying, I want to start at request of result zero, or I want to start for page two, I want to start at result 20. In order for, the reason the performance is so bad is because in order for Solar to know what is the 20th result to start on page two, it has to compute one through 19 first. And in order to start at the 200,000th result and know what are the next thousand after that, it has to first figure out the first 199,999. So we switch the model up. And instead of passing a start in a rows, you can still pass rows, you still tell it how many you want per page. But now you tell it you want to start a cursor. And what it gives you back is the next value. So there's still, uh, I forgot to include it up there, there's still a rows parameter. The only other difference is you have to have a sort on your ID. It can be a tiebreaker. You can still sort on score first. You can still sort on nine other fields first. But ultimately, your ID has to be in there somewhere as a tiebreaker. Okay? And once you've done that, you'll get back your full page, but then you'll get this next cursor mark. And when you want page two, you just pass that in in the URL. And it knows where to pick up where it left off. It's, it's stateless. It doesn't, you could load balance this across multiple servers. What that cursor value is doing actually is encoding information about the relative sort values of the results you've already seen so that it knows how much to skip over, right? But this winds up being super efficient. The green line here, this is the performance of a cursor. There's still occasional spikes. Honestly, I think I was watching a video when I ran this test. Um, <laughs> You know, but admittedly, I mean, garbage collection's still a factor, but like I said, this is on my laptop, this is single-threaded. I mean, that's the big caveat here. This is, you know, there's only one client hitting the solar server, but, you know, 90% of the processor was me checking my mail and watching TV. Uh, but you can see the performance here is, you know, I think it's safe to call that flat, right? It is, it is the state, all the state that is needed is passed back in this value. The server doesn't care. So you can load balance this request across, if you had 10 identical solar servers, you could load balance this request, and, that val and you could jump between them, and it's not gonna matter, right? All of the state that you need to make that second request is encoded right there. There's, okay, so there are good docs online. I, I don't wanna spend too much, if, if, we, if we have time at the end, I will happily go into that, because I worked on this feature, and I'm like really excited by it. So I can talk you through all sorts of use cases of if you re-index in the middle of walking a cursor and what things impact other things. There isn't a search release in this situation, which is one thing that people have asked about. Um, you don't, you're not guaranteed a perfectly consistent result. It's not, it's not like a database cursor where it's actually like locking rows and keeping track. Um, you know, we could talk through the specific details, but for the most part it winds up being, if you read all the docs online, it winds up being pretty much what you would want in a lot of cases. Um, without actually having a true transactional lock on the whole setup. As a what, sir? Yeah, you, I mean, it, well you can. There are use cases where that makes sense, but yeah, and for the most part, you wouldn't want to like be giving this to an end user in a UI where they might bookmark it and expect it to mean something. Um, but for, for bulk data processing, right, for I need to find all of the results that match this query and I need to fetch them over the wire efficiently, this works great. Also, even if you're not gonna fetch them all, even if it's like, okay, I know there's a million results, I need to walk them in order by score until I meet some new criteria that I can't do on the server side that I have to do as part of my processing, right? You can give up at any time. You know, it's not like you have to release a, a, a transactional lock or anything. You can walk until you're done, whether that means you collect them all or you collect half. So, um, like I say, this is a really cool feature. I think it's really powerful. Could be useful in UIs, but mainly this is gonna be really useful for when you're like, nope, I need to fetch every row out of my solar index, even if there's a billion of them, I need to process them externally. Um, any other questions? Oh, right, as I mentioned, the green line, green is good. Um, any other questions about this? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, so the very first call, the way you start a cursor, 
is you send asterisk. It's just the magic value that means I want to take advantage of the cursor feature, and by doing that, you will get page one, and that's what starts computing the next one for you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's why I say there's no, the server is not keeping track of any state. You don't have to do, yeah, you don't have to do it. You can, you can make this request, and Solar will generate and tell you what the next one is, and then Solar forgets all about it. And your next request could be to a completely different server, or you could never make that next request. You can, you can stop whenever you want to stop. Yeah. No, no, no worries. No worries. I, 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 if you missed it, other people missed it, and I want to reiterate it, so no problem. Yeah. No, no worries. No worries. Okay. So that was cursors. Um, the next big thing I want to talk about that I think is really cool since 4.0 is uh, doc values and how doc values impact sorting and faceting. So again, brief refresher, who here really fully truly understands what an inverted index is? Yeah, I was gonna say, if you didn't raise your hand, I was gonna be very upset with you. Um, okay, so the quick summary is an inverted index is taking all of your data and inverting it. Instead of saying, you know, normally you would think of I have documents, and document number four has a title, Legends from the End of Time. An inverted index is saying, no, 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 what I really care about is, I have the word legend, what documents is it in, right? Having an inverted index makes term searches really fast. Because by definition, it's like, oh, I wanna find all the documents with legends. Well, these terms are all in order, so I can skip ahead easily, I can have, you know, uh, a B tree or whatever I need to find the term I care about, and then I can quickly iterate through the documents that match it, right? So it's very fast for term searches. It's also very fast for range searches, because since the terms are in order, if I say I wanna find everything that has a, uh, a, I don't even know what field this is supposed to be, a popularity uh, higher than four, I scan until I find my first value, which is higher than four, I scan all those documents, I go to the next term, I go to the next term, et cetera, right? So inverted index, Hot shit, that's how IR tools become really fast, because they have fast lookup. What they are not, what an inverted index is not really good for is fast sorting and fast faceting. The sorting problem is really that once you've matched a bunch of documents, if these are the documents that we've matched on, and we've said, you know, we, we need to sort all these, if this is the data structure you're working on, if I told you I wanted to sort on this popularity value, which document should come first, there's not a lot to work with here, you know? You gotta go be like, uh, fuck, uh, well, I guess, the, the, you know, it's a pain in the ass. So what Lucene and Solar have got and what has been around in Lucene since day one is this concept of a field cache. A field cache is an uninverted field. A field cache at, at runtime is a built up array indexed by the document ID where you reverse the value. So you say, okay, well, 1.8 is D5, so I'll skip down to D5, I'll fill in 1.8. Uh, D2 is 3.2, so I'll find D2, add 3.2. And what you wind up with is, ironically, something that looks exactly like your input. Um, except that it's being built at runtime, uh, when you load the index into RAM, and it's being maintained in RAM, and as soon as you update your index, you have to throw it away and rebuild it from scratch because it's an array indexed by document. Um, it winds up being very silly and not very efficient to build that. Once you have it built, your sorting and faceting is very fast, but it takes a while to build that red up. And as we've talked about before, red is bad. Doc values are green. Doc values are very good. Doc values came along in like 4.2 or something. Um, I honestly could not explain to you why it took us so long to build doc values because it's like, hey, you have input? Let's just put it in the index exactly the way we got it. Why is this so hard? That's a low level question that I'm not gonna try and answer. Uh, Robert Muir is a very smart guy. If you can find him sober later today, um, possibly during his talk, uh, you can ask him why are doc values so hard and why did it take us so long to have them, and he will explain it. But the bottom line is now we have a data structure that does exactly what we want and makes sorting and faceting very fast. Doc values is fairly easy to use in solar. Um, just like we have always had an indexed property and a stored property that I didn't bother to include here, which can be true or false, you can also have a doc values property, which can be true or false. Um, doc values is completely independent to index values. Right? So for example, um, something like a rating field, if I wanna do fast range queries on my rating field, I probably still wanna index it. If I wanna say find me all documents where the rating is greater than five, I could do that with doc values alone, but it's not as fast as still building that inverted index. If I wanna sort on ratings, that's where having doc values turned on is really handy, okay? Uh, likewise, uh, if I have a field just for sorting, 
In the past, you had to index that field in order to sort on it because we had to build that field cache up. Nowadays, you don't. You can sort on a field even if it's not indexed as long as you have doc values turned on. Um, other things though, like if you just want to search on something, you have a title field, you want to tokenize on that text, you want to ser search on that text, there, I mean, there's no reason for doc values there. It's, it doesn't add you anything. The inverted index is still the most powerful way to do all of that. Um, but like I said, you know, you can have, you can use your copy fields, you can have two different versions of your title. One where you tokenize for searching, and one what normally would have been just a simple index string, now it can be a simple doc value on the string. Okay? Question, yeah? It is not required to have a default value for doc values. It was in the first, when it first sort of got added to Solar it was, it is no longer the case. So that's a good question, thank you. Um, right, so that's doc values added to the schema. Any question, other questions about doc values? Oh yeah, yeah, sorry. Fast, fast, thing. yeah, I, I, I tend to focus on the sorting because it's the easier one to explain why it's fast, but trust me when I say doc values is fast for faceting as well, all because really we're still, the way we normally facet is by using this field cache, and, it, and now we're just eliminating the need to build that field cache at request time in RAM. We have the doc values that we build up front when we build that index, and that same structure can very efficiently be used to facet at request time. Yeah, Jack. That's why, yeah, so Jack's question was, going back to my point about like, hey, the input looks very similar to doc values, why is this hard? His question was what about the stored values, right? Like if we said I wanna store the rating field so that it comes back in the response, why, what is the difference between the data structure for stored values versus doc values? That's a Robert Muir question. Uh, there, you know, the implementation details of what exactly is going on with how doc values and that doc values data structure gets built up for the segment when you build the index versus the stored fields and why it took us so many fucking decades before we got doc values uh, is kind of over my head, so I'm gonna defer that to Robert Muir, or perhaps Marvin, because although Marvin says he's not running Solar Lucene, he actually knows a shit ton about the decisions that went into the index format, because he had to do them all over again in C. I can get basics on that later. Uh, well, it's, it's simply that uh, you would have, say, uh, uh, the, the, the document store is going to be basically like a serialized hash table. Uh, uh, it's going to be you know, a, a, a integer followed by a field length, and that's not going to be something you can access quickly on the fly during uh, uh, runtime if you need to actually extract that value to sort on it. So that doc values, uh, although I don't know exactly the implementation in Lucene, I've done something very similar in a, in a different uh, uh, search engine library, and what you basically have is a something approximating an array, and you might have an array of ordinal numbers associated with each uh, right. document as well. And that's what's happening at a low level. Right. All right. Are you, you're, you're not talking about index structures at all. To, you're talking about an incubator talk later, right? Are you doing a Lucy talk? Are you doing I'm an internal? Lucy talk. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm sorry. I was just going to, I was going to refer you all to Marvin's talk for more in details on low level index implementation details, except that's not the talk he's giving, so please pretend I didn't say anything. Um, okay. So that was doc values. And now I'm going to check my time, and my time is good. And we're going to talk about Solar Cloud, except we're just going to scratch the surface on Solar Cloud because I'm not a Solar Cloud expert, and there's some really good Solar Cloud talks coming up today. Um, I do want to touch on three large classes of new features in Solar Cloud, the three sort of big things that you should know about. Well, actually, there's four big things you should know about new in Solar Cloud since 4.0. The first is it actually works really good now. Uh, when 4.0 came out, Solar Cloud was a much hype, like, this is new, we finally landed it in 4.0, you can use Solar Cloud. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Solar Cloud is the more natural distributed version of Solar. We had, uh, you know, we had distributed search in the 3x version of Solar, but it was very clunky to set up, it was very, you know, you had to very hand manage a lot of things. Uh, Solar Cloud is more of the, you have a cluster of servers, and you let it worry about things. Um, it existed in 4.0, but it was very not good. Um, I can't even, in my, off the top of my head, enumerate the things that were not good about it, but it was definitely, it, it was still very finicky, still very temperamental, you still had to handhold a lot. So the zero thing that I didn't put on this slide is that as of like 4.7 and 4.8 will come out soon, Solar Cloud is actually pretty freaking rock solid now. Um, but in terms of features beyond just stability, the three classes of features that I, I really key for people to know about if you're moderately familiar with Solar Cloud before. Um, the first is custom sharding. Uh, by default in Solar, uh, your documents, you know, you, you say I have, I want 10 shards, 
and you throw documents in and Solar just decides where they go and it tries to break them up evenly based off of a, a hashing mechanism. Um, we now have some other options for let you control where it goes or to let you, well, you can either explicitly, ironically, by using the router called implicit, you can explicitly say I want it to be in this shard uh, so that you can manage things on a very fine-grained fine -grained basis if you want to do like sharding by date or something, you can very explicitly say like, no, no, this is my January shard, this is my February shard, and you can shove the data where you want. Um, but also that, that hash-based sharding that I talked about, now you have the ability to influence that by using a, uh, if you structure your ID space in a certain way, you can do prefix-based sharding, right? So you can, for example, build up uh, unique keys for your documents where the ID for the document, you encode information into it as a prefix to ensure that all documents of a certain type wind up in a certain shard, for example. Uh, the, one of the examples I think we use in the documentation is customers, right? If you were building a large e-commerce system where you were powering many merchants, you could encode the merchant ID into the document ID for each of the products that's you know, being sold through you um, to make sure that certain merchants all got routed, you know, that one merchant was always in its consistent sharding, which helps that the query time it then can be optimized. You can say, I'm only searching for a certain merchant, and it knows I don't need to query all 100 shards in my index. I can only query these 10, because I'm guaranteed the merchant will be there. So that's, a, that's one really major feature that came out around 4.4, 4.5, I don't remember when exactly. Um, as of, I think, 4.6, we started adding shard splitting. Uh, shard splitting is really awesome because it lets you say, I'm gonna build my solar cluster, I'm gonna have 10 nodes in it, I'm gonna create an index, I want 10 shards of my index. You can always add nodes later to add replicas, right, to add redundant copies of your data. What shard splitting started letting you do is say, fuck, I want more than 10 shards now. So you can either pick a shard that's getting big and just split it in half, or there's actually, you know, sort of customization options there to split on specific ranges of hash values, uh, or to split on certain fields even. Right? There's a lot you can do now with actually splitting a shard once your data grows, not just in terms of how many replicas you want, but actually, you know, to partition your data even more than when you started. Um, really powerful feature that a lot of people didn't think would ever work, but it does. Um, and then the third big feature is Hadoop integration. Uh, Mark Miller is giving a talk later today. Um, he works at Cloudera. He's been working on a lot of really cool stuff in terms of keeping your indexes in HDFS and also doing sort of offline index building with MapReduce uh, directly into Solar Cloud. Um, I couldn't even begin to describe sort of how these work, but it's pretty cool, and he should be talking about that later. All of these things in general and many more will be talked about in a couple really key Solar Cloud talks. Right after this talk, uh, Tim Potter, who I work with, is giving a, a really good introduction to Solar Cloud. So if you're not super familiar with Solar Cloud, that's the next talk to go to, absolutely and he'll cover uh, particularly shard splitting and the composite shard stuff. And then the Hadoop integration, like I say, Mark Miller should be talking about that. Um, any other questions about solar cloud stuff? Like I say, there's, there's a bunch of really good solar cloud talks, so I didn't want to spend too much time on it. But if anybody has specific questions off this, I'm happy to cover it. Yeah. So, yeah, so as you, you mean upgrading, like if you started with solar cloud, yeah. There, I mean, the back compatibility, there's a lot of attempts to be solid with the back compatibility on upgrading. I know there's been at least one or two where we had oh shit moments where people didn't realize how they were affecting some upgrades. So mostly, mostly what you have to worry about with upgrading is there might be, in the, in the data that's kept in Zookeeper, the cluster state, there's been one or two times where people, like as a result of people not realizing how they broke some back compatibility, people have had to manually edit their cluster state information. But the indexes themselves, for the most part, um, with, with Solar Cloud, that, that upgrade is smooth. Uh, it's, like I said, it's mostly it's been a question of like, oh, like metadata, that you know, somebody didn't realize how they impacted the way the metadata is tracked, and we didn't have a robust enough upgrade test to catch it. So some of those have bit us after the fact, so you may run into some problems like that, but the, the, the larger issue of like, do I need to completely re-index my billion documents to upgrade my Solar Cloud? No, we haven't run into anything like that. Um, what time is it? Oh. We're running way ahead, so we're gonna have lots of time for questions. Um, because the last sort of big thing I wanna talk about is documentation. Um, and, and not just any documentation, good documentation. Uh, Solar, for those of you who've been around since the early days, has always really lacked in high quality documentation. What we had is we had the wiki, and we had a lot of people putting a lot of, um, what's the word I wanna look for here? Hmm. A, lot of, a lot of enthusiasm 
into the wiki, uh, and a lot of good intentions into the wiki, but it has always been very chaotic. There has never been any sort of one shepherd of the wiki. It's always been, yes, the great, the community is chipping in the documentation, but when a million people get in a room and document stuff, they all have their own voice, they all have their own ideas about what's important. You know, somebody reads, uh, you know, the Tomcat page, here's how to set it up on Tomcat, and if it doesn't work for them because they have some broken, you know, Linux distribution, then they think, oh no, like, here's how I did it, and it's like 800 steps, and you're like, no, that's, <sighs> thank you for your effort, but man, that's now just gonna confuse the shit out of everybody. Um, we still have the wiki, although there's some questions about that, but what we have now is an actual reference guide, right? So we've done, since 4.0, two, two different things have happened. One is that the Javadocs for things like update processors and our analysis tokenizer factories and all those things, those are all actually really good to the point where end users can read them, they have examples. But more importantly, we have this reference guide now since like 4.2. Um, it is maintained 100% by the developers. It is not, you know, a hodgepodge of community edits. It is, you know, it is, it is maintained by the developers. Because it's maintained by the developers and there is some control on who can edit it, uh, that also gives us the ability to actually release it. It is officially released by the Apache Software Foundation. It appears on the Mirror Network. It clocks in at like, uh, it's a PDF, eight by 11, 12 point font, clocks in at almost 400 pages. Um, it is a very good comprehensive guide for new and moderate users. Um, by the time you have read that, if you understand all of that, 99% of what isn't covered just makes sense to you. You know, like intuitively, like when you start looking at the config, you can sort of walk your way through it. So I do want to mention that as to me, this is a massive new feature in Solar that we have this documentation and that it's actually useful and good. And I wanted to make sure that if people weren't familiar with it, if you've looked at the docs, you know, even two years ago and thought, man, Solar documentation sucks, give it another shot. Um, other things that are new in Solar, I did not think I would have enough time for them, so I did not write slides about them, but there are a lot of other really awesome things that have come out in 4.0, and I do encourage you guys to check out uh, both the changes. Uh, every time we release Solar, it is the full changes of everything ever, and it's got a nice, you know, easy way to drill down into specifics. But also, if you look at the news section of the Solar website, with every major release, uh, we try to distill down what we think the really biggest features are, the ones that are most notable, and those go into the release highlights. Um, so I encourage you guys to check that out as well. Um, and like I say, we have now plenty of time for questions because I clearly underestimated my talking speed once again. Um, oh, I do, the last thing I wanted to mention, uh, there is a conference dedicated specifically to Solar and Lucene put on by Lucidworks. Shameless plug for my employer, Lucidworks, puts on the Solar Lucene Revolution Conference. Uh, the call for speakers is currently open. The next one is gonna be in DC in November. Uh, so if you have a talk you wanna do about Solar uh, or about Lucene, um, Again, you don't have to be an expert, you don't have to be a committer. It, use case stories, this is how we use solar at my company, are always interesting, because uh, people like to see how other people uh, solve their particular problems using the toolkits that they're familiar with. But also it gives people ideas of, uh, you know, how did you overcome, you know, you have interesting problems, I might have similar problems, how did you overcome your problems, how did you solve your challenges, how did you implement your scheme? That kind of shit's always interesting to people, so I encourage everybody to check out the CFP if you use solar at all. Um, and submit to that. And then uh, other important URLs that you may want to look at. So, with that said, like I, like I mentioned before, we have lots of time for questions. We do have a mic, which I forgot earlier, but Artem has the mic, so. Please raise your hand, because uh, our sessions are audio recorded. Oh yes, the audio is being recorded, yes. Just a question on, what is actually in 471? Do you know, like, what the main feature were? Because it's just okay, like so, a bunch of hot So 471 bugs. is a bug fix release. Yeah. So 471 in theory has no actual new features. Um, I think there is in fact actually a new feature in 4.7.1 that kind of slipped in. Um, in 4.8, um, off the top of my head, no, I don't, because to be honest, it blurs in with me. I, I operate off SVN so much that I kind of lose track of what features are in which releases. Um, I, we can look that up though, honestly, it takes about two minutes here, let's see. Well, well, there's a question they're going to support the new uh, Java version, right? And yes. Well, so, I mean, the, by supporting the new Java version, um, so we've, we've supported Java 7 and Java 8 for a while in so much as we've supported anything, which is that we run tests on it. So the, the 4X branch and the trunk branch, we have had tests running on the Java 8 developer builds since they started doing Java 8 developer builds. 
Um, so in theory, it is supported just as much as anything else. What has changed specifically, which is a good point to bring up for people who don't follow the list on a, on a super active basis, um, the decision was made, uh, ironically, while I was on vacation, so I really had no input into it, so I'm not gonna comment now on whether I agree with it or not, but the decision was made that uh, we would, um, the, the source code has always been uh, Java 6 compatible. Uh, basically, we always guaranteed that the source code could be compiled against Java 6, and the binary versions we release, um, you know, to like Maven Central and all that, would be able to run on a Java 6 JVM. Uh, what the, the decision that was made was that 4.7 would be the last release tree that would support Java 6. Um, starting with 4.8, if you want to compile or run, you have to have a, uh, a Java 7 uh, JDK or a Java 7 JVM. And that decision was made largely because of the fact that even Java 7 is officially end of life now, if I remember right. So if you're still running Java 6, you're really far behind in terms of your production JVM. Um, part of it is also that all, so many other projects use Lucene, it's kind of a good kick in the pants to motivate other projects to think about supporting that now. So um, that is the big sort of decision maker of if you really need to run on a Java 6 JVM, you, you are gonna be stuck with 4.7 or 4.71. There will probably be a 4.72 pretty soon um, in terms of those bug fix releases. Uh, in terms of what features are in 4.8, like I said, I can look that up if people are curious as to what's coming in 4.8. Uh, to be honest, I was on vacation and then I came back and I tried to catch up and I, off the top of my head, don't know what's, in, what's new since the 4.7 branch. Yeah, I don't, I, I, there's a lot of little stuff, right? If I remember right. Oh, okay, sorry. We're gonna, we're gonna hand them back to the Ionic. It looks like there's just one new feature, um, editing files um, in the conf directory um, from the admin oh, UI. Oh, the, the UI based one for 4.8? That's the only thing for 4.8? I think, because also, um, yeah, well, I mean, that's off by default, but I think the other thing that I believe is coming in 4.8 is the, um, there's some new, that same REST API we talked about for managing fields and field types. The, the field type part, I don't think will be ready for 4.8, not or shape, no, okay. But what I believe will be in 4.8 is um, there's some new, this would have made a great slide had it been done in time to me to submit my slides because I had to submit these like a month ago, which is silly. Um, but one of the other new cool things that Tim worked on, Tim, the next speaker, Tim Potter, uh, Tim and Steve worked on some new stuff to hook into the REST API from uh, specific resources. So for example, the, the, the two that we started with is synonyms and stop words. Um, even though you can't manipulate the field type, the full field type declaration, what you can say is you can figure a field type using stop words and say, I want the stop words to be REST editable. So now there's a REST endpoint where you can change the stop words on the fly if you're using MetLake query time. Same with synonyms, if you're using query time based synonyms, that you can all do that dynamically now. Um, so I think that'll be in 4.8. I was gonna say, I was like, yeah, yeah, sorry. He doesn't need the mic. He's I, was, I was reading the 5.0 I was gonna list. say, I was like, there was so way there, there more are a lot it. of uh, yeah. things, and I'm not gonna go through them here. Yeah, no, that's fine. There's a lot of little stuff, I think, in 4.8, but I think the one sort of big thing in 4.8 is the, the synonym stop word APIs, and the fact that that hook now exists. Pretty much any uh, resource like that that you can think of where you wanna make it restable, um, you can write a, basically a, a plug engine. Oh yeah, so that goes back. Um, the easiest way to find it. So if you want to know what's new, that's all about the changes file. So it's all in a uh, SVN. So we'll go to dev trunk solar. Things. And we do our SVN dance. Oh, I think this is a net dance. This SVN is usually faster than this. Um, but not for the 4.8 stuff. Oh, via Jenkins, yeah, yeah, okay, sorry. He doesn't need the mic. What he was talking about was if you go to our Jenkins build, also you can see the annotated version. Um, I'm not gonna do that just yet, but uh, if you go to our, uh, our build system, Jenkins.apache.org, you can see an annotated HTML generated version of this that makes it easy to drill down. Um, but the changes.txt, like this is what Yannick made the mistake. This is the the 5.0 version. This is what's new. But if you skip past that to 4.8, um, you'll see you know the important things to know about upgrading to 4.8, uh, but then also the detailed changes. So new features, um, some new AWS APIs in terms of uh, Solar Cloud, the new REST manager that I was mentioning before for like synonyms and stop word stuff. But again, you can plug in kind of anything you can imagine can be plugged into that REST API hook that we've now added. Um, 
Uh, some new exclusion options on the stats component, uh, some new highlighter options, uh, some authentication stuff. Oh, the exp expand and collapse component. Oh, and doc expiration. Right, I just wrote that one. Um, which lets you expire documents, you know, have a time to live on your documents when you index them and say, I want this to expire after a year, it'll be automatically deleted from your index. So there's, I mean, there's a good handful of stuff coming out in 4.8, but nothing that I was like worried about editing the slides to update, so, yeah. With all your fast and furious releases that you guys have been doing lately, congratulations, by the way. Um, how, what's the upgrade path look like? Is it usually just a drop-in replacement? So in an ideal world, 90% of the time, upgrade is a drop-in replacement. When there's not a drop-in replacement, in some cases, there will be, in some cases, we'll take, we'll bite the bullet and say, to make the common case better for new users, we're gonna change a default, for example. And what we try to do then is in this upgrading section, there will be notes about what you need to change based on how the, you know, like if you were using this particular feature, the default behavior has changed. So to get consistent behavior with what you were expecting in the past, this is what you need to add. So for example, um, you know, uh, there's, there's this comment here, this is the comment here about uh, how the, the term length, again, don't worry about reading, it's more for my own. But basically what this is describing is the fact that in older versions of solar, if you had a term that was too big, there's some like low level implementation uh, restrictions on how large an individual term can be in Lucene. Um, and if it was too big, it would just get silently ignored. And we decided silently ignoring data problems is bad. So in the new version, it fails and you get an error. If you don't wanna get an error and you want it to silently be ignored, here's instructions on what to change in your schema for that to happen, right? Um, that's, that's the kind of thing that 90% of the time happens on upgrades. As I mentioned though in the question about solar cloud, Sometimes there's back compatibility issues with either the, um, the binary protocol for sending data over the wire that makes it so that you have to kind of do the upgrade steps in a certain order, or you have to upgrade your clients and lockstep with your server. You know, some of those things come out. Sometimes there's like, oh, you have to edit some metadata in cluster state. Um, you know, we're, we aim for drop-in replacement at least between major versions. When you go from like four to five, there might be bigger things to worry about, but from like four six to four seven, ideally, you just drop in the war, the old config behaves as it did but it's always good to read the upgrade notices, so. Um, I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, are we out of time? It's yeah, time. We, have, we have one minute left. Can you do your question in 10 seconds? Yes, I was wondering, uh, are you supporting Maven as far as the release platform? So Maven is, uh, let me start that sentence over. Support is a very vague, yeah, it's a very vague term. Um, Maven, we do distribute jars and wars to Maven. Maven is not our build system though, so occasionally it gets out of sync and we'll discover that there's a glitch in the metadata in the Maven files. Um, but you can always find the files in Maven. You just might, when you download them, discover that some transitive dependency is declared wrong because we don't notice it because it's not our major build system. We do have tests that try to check that the Maven build is consistent, but it has occasionally popped up. But you should always, when we do a release, we always upload the jars and wars into Maven. So you should always be able to find them in Maven, um, yeah. But you know, support, I, I, always, I always like to use quotes around the word support because support is a very vague construct with Apache. So anyway, um, that is all the time we've got. Thank you for your brief question very right at the end. So we could fill the whole hour. Um, thank you very much everybody. Like I mentioned, Tim's talk is coming up next, Intrix Solar Cloud, and uh, I hope that you have a good conference. Thank you.